Welcome to the Air Mirror Trading Group 1. Today is the 8th of March, 2022. So welcome, everyone. Um, as you know, I was, I was traveling, so I was a uh, thank, big thank you to Tim Pearson for running the last two meetings while I was gone. Uh, my wife's uh, mom passed away, unfortunately, so we had to fly to Belgium, and then everybody wanted to see us while we were there, and hotel internet was pretty bad. Actually, the first one was okay, 90 up and 90 down, but then we got to Germany, it was 15 down and one up. And then the, the Sheridan Hotel at Brussels Airport was like three up and three down. It was terrible. So I'm glad we didn't have any meetings. I had to run when I was in those bad internet hotels. So that's the thing for the future to check that speed before I go anywhere. Um, so let's see, I guess just a couple of things uh, before I know Steve's here. We want to talk about a few things with that. Um, but we have, uh, let's see, where is it? So the sleep well, uh, earlier today, it had a, a new high. I think it pulled back a little bit. The market's been rallying. Um, I think it was uh, like down here. Gold is probably the culprit. Oops, where's gold? So yeah, so it looks like it pulled back from the high. So uh, the sleep well was at an all-time high earlier today, but you can see it's right up there um, versus um, the SPY and um, risk parity in 6040 is doing pretty well. So, congrats, Wayne, on the uh, on the sleep well. It's uh, it finally uh, hit its stride, so to speak, in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then tomorrow we have a roundtable with Steve, who's actually here talking about butterflies. The time for them is now, and uh, Steve will go over a little bit maybe today what he's going to talk about tomorrow, um, but. Um, what I've seen in the forums, uh, Steve, uh, looks pretty good. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing what you have to say. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it as well. So um, I can give a little sneak preview whenever you want here, if you'd like, Tom. Otherwise, we'll just do it tomorrow. Yeah, we can do that. Let me uh, find my meeting control. There we go. It's on my other screen. Yes, yeah, so if you want to share your screen. screen here. Sure. So um, let me... Uh, let me find my image I was looking for here. Um, shoot, where did that go? Sorry about that, guys. Um, let me just snap a fresh screenshot here. Oh, here it is. So I was just going to show my current uh, open positions. Again, my, my goal is I'm going to offer uh, a class on butterflies and variations of butterflies. Uh, are you guys able to see my screen here right now? Yeah, sure am. Okay. So these are my current open positions. Um, the premise behind what I'm going to share a couple of years ago, a gentleman who became a friend of mine, a fellow trader, uh, he runs a hedge fund, an international hedge fund. And he was telling me, you know, how great butterflies were working for him. So I kind of started down the butterfly hole, if you will. A couple of years ago, did an immense amount of back testing, then an immense amount of paper trading, all of which I'll share in the session tomorrow. Uh, started live trading these probably six months or so ago. I'll be sharing all those results as well. Um, but particularly in these volatile markets, uh, these things are just awesome. And I've traded for 30 plus years. So I know that Anytime a trader says they got it figured out, they're going to get slapped. And that's not my goal here. Obviously, these, these uh, have a certain market condition. We're in that market condition now. And that's why I want everyone to um, pay attention to them, uh, kind of see what makes them work, et cetera. Um, the past month or two, I've been at 10% a month on these. And with what is really, in my mind, relatively low risk. You can see how flat these T0 lines are on pretty much all these positions. And, um, you know, I, I'll show an example of a slate of butterflies like this that was open, and then the market gap down 100 points. And we'll look at each one of these and see what happens when the market gaps against you 100 points in these. How bad is it going to hurt compared to other types of trades? And you'll see that it doesn't hurt. So, the, anyhow, that's kind of the sneak preview, if you will, of, of uh, what I hope to share with people tomorrow. And then I will be offering classes and an alert service and coaching. Um, I will say this is going to be a little different than what you're used to as an alert service, because my goal is um, 
to basically have, uh, let me see if I can find an example here. I want my alerts to be video alerts. Um, and it's not going to be for a specific type of, uh, it's not going to be a set trade. So I want people to learn butterflies overall. So I'm just going to play this example. This will be an experiment too, because hopefully you guys will see and hear this. I was okay. trying to put a little adjustment on this trade uh, just because of the potential for more downside market move. And I don't want to really uh, give this up. I've got a nice, you know, seven, 8% uh, profit in this trade right now. Uh, there's a couple of different ways this can be adjusted. I'll be covering those in my class. And again, I'll be talking about my class on Aeromir here uh, on March 9th and giving more details on that. But a couple of different adjustments we might consider here. Uh, so we don't need to go into all the details there, but the, the premise is that in the past when I've personally subscribed to alert services, um, I think I'm in the same position that the person providing the alerts is in, but you can't see anything visually. So I would go and make adjustments. And then in one of these sessions, I would see a position that somebody was in. It's like, oh my God, theirs looks totally different than mine looks. I either missed an adjustment somewhere along the way, or possibly I didn't get the fill at the same time. So my position looked totally different. So my goal is to be able to send out brief little one or two minute videos like this that will literally show you the exact position, possible different adjustment techniques that you might consider, and then ultimately why I would go one way or the other. So that's kind of the 10,000 foot view, if you will. So it's gonna be a little different than what everybody's used to, but hopefully you'll find it beneficial. Now, Steve, I, I, know I was thinking um, when I saw that uh, all those different butterflies, he had a comment that Charles Cottle had years ago. He said, have 10 positions, three leaning long, three leaning short, mm -hmm. uh, three point. neutral and one spec trade. That kind of reminded me of your arsenal of butterflies or whatever, your flock. That's correct. And that's, that's not unlike, um, you know, that's not unlike what I will be doing. Yes. Now I should also say that that whole arsenal of butterflies that I showed there, that was, um, uh, that was a whole host of them. Some of them are in my long only investment account and they're tilted. And we're going to talk about that too. We're going to talk about how to hedge um, potential long-term investments using butterflies as well. So you're right. Those things were kind of scattered all over the board as far as how they're tilted and they're done that way for different reasons, which we'll get into. So with the class, are you going to do uh, multiple butterflies at once or just one at a time? No, I'll have, uh, uh, my goal is to have at least one, if not two a week that I'll put on. They will be various different expirations, uh, DTEs, because I want people to learn, you know, well, how does a, a seven day or a 14 day work differently than a 45 day, for example. So we'll put on a variety of those. And then uh, again, my goal, we'll explain more tomorrow, but my goal is also then going to be to uh, every week we'll have a session. Um, usually it'll probably be Sunday evenings because I work for a company called Option Alpha during the week, uh, helping out their traders. So it'll probably be Sunday nights and it'll be recorded and we'll do a run through of all of our open positions, any adjustments that were made. We'll look at the market conditions that we think might be happening for the next week. Of course, nobody knows and how we might be looking for certain types of trades to put on in that upcoming market condition. So ultimately we'll have on one to two a week, the class will run over a period of five weeks. So, you know, by the time we're done, we could have on, I don't know, five, 10 or more of them. Okay. And again, in all different durations and to some extent, maybe even in different underlines for the most part, I trade SPX and RUT, but I've also done these in Google and Amazon and, you know, some of the other uh, larger stocks as well. Have you ever done any with futures options? I have. It's been a long time, and that's actually something we can experiment with. Um, I, I literally was looking at that a couple nights ago when we had that big down move during the night. Um, I'm thinking, man, this is a perfect time to put one of those on. And I debated about going up and firing up my computer and, and putting one out there. I ended up not doing it. Um, but 
um, there's no reason we can't do that. And that will be one of the things that we'll get, we'll dig into. I'll show examples of ones that are done in ES versus ones that are done in SPX. And we'll talk about the, the different requirements as far as um, obviously the times they trade, but also the different margin requirements, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, the futures options, they do have a little gotcha if you're doing spreads, if the spreads over $5, it's 25 cent increments. So it can't be quite as granular, but the right. span margin on a small account is nice. Yep. And I pretty much trade these in 10 point increments anyway. I, I don't even deal with the fives. I just remove the fives from ONE. Just, it's just less confusing for me that way. Right. So I'll share my screen. If you go to the uh, the calendar page on the member site, uh, you'll see um, for tomorrow's roundtable, there's a register link over here on the right. So if you didn't get the, the, the link in the chat or if you're watching the recording, just go to the calendar and then just click on this register link and that'll get you all set. And do you send out an email to members on this too, Tom, or not? I'm not sure. Again, this is this is all new for me. Yeah, so everybody, basically, when they join uh, Aramir, they, they're on the roundtable list. So um, any roundtable, there's a, an email that goes out uh, 24 hours prior, and then also 35 minutes prior, I think it is. Oh, perfect. So just, okay. just as a reminder. And then we'll send another one out just uh, in case uh, that automated one kind of misses the mark. But um, just as a reminder, I think it'll be good. And, and normally we do the round tables at 11 a.m. Eastern, but this is a little bit later because Steve's got other things to do during the day as well. So we're doing this at, now this is mountain time. So this is 4.30 uh, Eastern, right? which would be 1.30 Pacific. Yep, yep. And again, the key to these is um, if you've ever considered butterflies, don't wait. This is the market for butterflies, and it's something you need to learn. Not all markets are right for butterflies, but uh, given what we're looking at in the foreseeable future um, with the volatility that's out there, with the fact that the S&P is so hugely overpriced right now anyway, um, personal opinion is that we're looking at some protracted time of pullbacks. I mean, probably months, if not years, of potential pullbacks coming, or at least lower lows. I mean, we're making lower highs and lower lows right now. Uh, and I'll show you with some fundamentals how overstretched our current market is. So anyhow, just um, all, all that will be recorded, I believe, Tom. So if you can't make it tomorrow, you'll certainly see it uh, later as well. Absolutely. I, uh, I post these on, the, uh, on our YouTube channel and also on the member uh, library, of course. So Lots of ways to see it if you can't see it live. Um, and by the way, for the uh, the recordings, um, Amy had her thing last week on the A14 update, um, but I was traveling and the, uh, the upload speed was pretty bad. So I actually uploaded that last night. So if you go to the library, you'll see Amy's recording here. Uh, it was recorded on the Mar March 2nd, but I posted it last night. So. Anybody who's got free access to the library, they'll only go back a week. So normally they would have like one day to watch it. So I just set the date to the 8th of March. So everybody has a, a chance to take a look. And that was a really good session as well. I was in on that one. And the A14, quite frankly, has been kicking butt. It's a form of a butterfly. And it's been doing real well in this market. Uh, also, I, I literally just pulled one off just before this class. It was another approximately 10%. Uh, winner. It was on for, I think, seven days or five days. So it's, um, again, it's it's in the butterfly family. And it's one of the things we'll talk about in our class. I'm not, of course, going to be, um, you know, giving out Amy's trades or anyone else's trades. We're going to talk about butterflies in general. I want people Steve's to... trades. <laughs> What's that? And Steve's trades. Well, yeah. And again, it's, I, I just want to be clear that it's not a a specific, you know, well, you put on this fly and then when the Delta gets to this, you do this. This is not gonna be a formula type of class. This is gonna be a class. So hopefully people will come away understanding all the nuances of butterflies so that they don't have to follow those specific patterns or those specific uh, things. And one of the challenges with following those specific rule sets in case people are not aware of it, um, 
the way deltas and things are calculated is different in all platforms and in all software. They, they each have their own proprietary way. So if I model a certain butterfly on ONE and I model that exact same butterfly on TOS, the Greeks are not going to be the same, even though you, you may use Black Shoals on both of them. Uh, and I and that's, learned that's a good, that that's a good reminder for people, whatever you're using, just stick with that one thing. Don't go back and forth because you're going to get different numbers and confuse yourself. Uh, correct. And that's also why in Amy's class, people said, well, what delta do I adjust this at? And, and Amy also, in my opinion, rightfully says, well, listen, we're not going to deal with a specific delta because it may be a you know, positive four delta on my platform, but it could be a positive six delta on TOS. Um, and of course, the deltas vary with how many butterflies you have on. So you've got to remember, oh, gee, Amy had 10, I've got five, I got to cut that number in half. You know, so my goal is to not have you have to deal with that sort of stuff. We'll give you a more intuitive understanding so that the, the deltas really aren't going to make a huge difference. So this is not a cookie cutter formula approach to this. This is a foundational educational approach to it. Then the uh, the trade alerts, uh, I think they're going to be billed quarterly, but um, that sounds like a good deal. So um, we'll, we'll find out more details tomorrow, though. Yep. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks for coming on, Steve. I talked to Dan Harvey uh, about an hour ago, and he couldn't make the today's meeting, but he and I are going to have a little one on one. To, uh, well, after this one's over, I'm going to call him. Uh, but he said his uh, box car has been doing two to five percent a week still even in this uh, um, crazy market i think he said he had one loser to a small small loss but overall he's very happy and it's quite robust so he just had one little tweak i think he said um, he was using a second debit spread optionally instead of leapfrogging on the first adjustment so but he and i are going to talk about that and then I'll start making everything ready. We're doing a, a round table next week, actually. So if we go to the calendar, and I'll just do round table, future ones. Uh, Greg Robinson, he, um, he runs a site basically in the UK for covered call kind of stuff. They, they also do the US market. Um, I think he was in Amy's A14. He's been in the capital discussions uh, um, group for a long time and now Aramir, um, but he's going to do a presentation on what they're doing with his son. And then Dan Harvey and I are on St. Patrick's Day, my son's birthday, and we're going to talk about the boxcar. And then uh, coming up in April, Hamanchu's, he's actually going to do two things. He, uh, he's going to do a workshop on technical analysis. Hamanchu is a chartered market technician, and he uses technical analysis for his calendar trades. Now, he's also known as the calendar king. He was written up in Stocks and Commodities Magazine years ago when I was the chair of mentoring. So they do a workshop on technical analysis and then one on butterfly uh, calendars because he uses technical analysis with his calendars. But that's that stuff's coming up and I'll try and get some more good speakers. But uh, for next week, we've got uh, Dan and I and then Greg Robinson and tomorrow, of course, Steve. Uh, let's see, uh, what else do we need to talk about? Um, just as something fun, I don't know if you guys have ever saw this. There's this old, <laughs> old video. The website is down. Sales guy versus web dude. Have you ever seen that, Steve? Maybe you're. I don't know. Maybe you saw. They've been around a while. No, I haven't. Oh, it's basic. It's it's pretty funny. You should watch it. It's but it's like you know, 15 years old probably. But it's basically the uh, the tech guy versus the sales guy. It's just pretty pretty good. <laughs> it's a classic. Uh, so that's good for a laugh uh, if you need one. Um, let's see. What else can we talk about? I know uh, Wayne is here too. I see some stuff in the chat. Let's see. Oh, please repaste the link. So that would be on the calendar here. Oh. And then he said he found it on the calendar page. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I also, when I was in Belgium, I had uh, um, dinner with a friend, Luke Van Hoff. What's that? Oh, this is mine. 
I'm not sure where yours is. That? Oh, it's uh, in the in the living room. Yep. Sorry, my wife was looking for her phone. Um. Oh yeah, so I had dinner with uh, Luke Van Hoff. He's uh, he used to work at Morgan Stanley years ago on the floor, and he's running a fund in Belgium. I think a couple hundred million. Um, but we were talking about some uh, ninja trader indicators that we both like. Um, he's going to show me what he's using those for, and then I can pass that on to you guys. But it's, um, I know he was trading some pretty short time frames at one point, like 50 tick charts. So they move pretty fast, but he's, um, he's a pretty good trader. He did options and futures on everything. But it was nice to catch up with him. Then Wayne, um, anything we should be talking about with the sleep well and awake? I think the awake finally uh, hit a new high, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Awake, awake slammed into a new high actually yesterday and then just kind of pushed it further today and kind of just doing its thing. Uh, there's a, I don't know if anyone heard of it, but there was a big announcement. I guess uh, uh, the Ukraine president is kind of, I guess he's con I guess he's conceding. Yeah, yeah. I guess he's uh, um, he's saying that he no longer wants to uh join NATO and stuff like that. And so that's why you saw the big reversal on gold and all that stuff, supposedly. But honestly, I mean, all of the signals were saying that the market was way oversold yesterday, and um, gold and even the dollar was just pushed to just extremes. You know, it was just it, this is typical crash behavior, right? Um, so it looks like a little bit of a reversal, a little bit of a cool off. And so, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat as Steven there is that, uh, um, you know, just because we put in a short term bottom doesn't mean that we're uh, going to V bottom and just go straight up from here. So um, markets don't go down straight down. They kind of bounce on their way down. So, yeah. Yeah, um, the daily it, charts fairly weak. Yeah, I mean, you know, so a positive thing, if, if anyone's, you know, just kind of looking for a positive thing is small caps have actually been holding their bottom pretty well lately. And small caps are typically like the risk on behavior, higher volatility, um, that type of thing. So that's been um, a relatively attractive place. And that's been a very, very uh, different story than what happened in all of 2021. So um, like I said, uh, there's there is a little bit of positive there that um, they're not falling uh, as aggressively or as fast as tech and large caps. Although last year, you know, in the commentaries that I was writing for subscribers and stuff like that is, it was pretty clear that tech and large caps were the favor and they were kind of ballooning and, and bubbling a little bit. So um, yeah, so, <clears throat> and we've actually cooled off fundamentally too a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of dig into that, but uh, have you ever, Tom, have you ever looked up like the the Buffett indicator? I have not. Is that something uh, you can show us? You know what? Just w just search in your Google search uh, the Buffett indicator, and it'll probably pull it up like first thing. Um, and uh, you'll probably it'll probably be that first site that pops up because it always does. Boom! Yeah, like first this one. one? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so scroll down just a little bit. Um, keep going, keep going, because there's a, a better graph down low. But they kind of live calculate this all the time. So it's kind of nice to just have this. Any source. particular one you're looking for? Uh, oh, keep coming down. Keep coming down. Keep coming down, down, down. Right there. Okay. This one. So, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, figure five. Figure five. Um, <clears throat> and this is just basically going to, hey, you know, what? Uh, what's the fundamental valuation of of the market right now, right? And this is as of uh, March 2nd, but they update, update this every now and then. So anyway, so you can kind of see how ballooned and bubbled up we got in 2021. And we were pushing kind of the all time highs of like what it was in the dot com bubble and stuff like that. So um, either one of two things have to happen for this to kind of cool off. Either the market has to come down or GDP has to go up, right? And um, or of course, a combination of the two. And yeah, so you can just see how overvalued stocks were as an asset class last year. And after all the printing of money and everything like that. And this is very similar to a lot of assets, um, but more particularly 
stocks are more significantly um, sensitive to growth and growth valuations, right? So uh, something that I was writing about uh, last December, last October, all that stuff, um, when, and actually we talked about it here on the Trading Group One, is that um, there's some significantly some significant growth slowing in Q1 and Q2 of 2022, right? We just made it through Q1, or we're pretty much through Q1. And Q2 is actually going to slow down more aggressively. Um, now, stocks do typically react before the slowdown. So we'll see how that kind of posts, but the numbers are going to get pretty significantly worse next quarter. And then we should have a cool off in Q3, and then it's going to get really bad again in Q4 or Q1 of uh, 2023. So um, kind of exactly on the on Stephen's notes, uh, it looks like this is going to be kind of a prolonged deal, but there's going to be bounces along the way. There's going to be tons of opportunity to make money in various formats and things like that. So it's not like the whole, you know, everything's just coming down, but um, there are assets that'll work well. Thank you for sharing that. I saw you uh, pop up. <laughs> can I use that tomorrow in my presentation as well? I think that's great uh, stuff to use. I'll, I'll reference your, uh, you mentioning it today. Oh, sure. Go for it, Steven. Yeah. Any way to help. I mean, I love butterflies. I love what you're doing, man. So, so this is a really exciting time because I pair butterflies with the sleep well portfolio and the awake because that's that's my passive portfolio or like semi-passive portfolio okay. that just kind of sits in the, in the background. So like, you know, because um, I typically only run maybe 15 all the way up to maybe 25% in the options. And then, so you got 75% that just kind of sits on the sidelines. Um, and even if you're trading like a planned capital trade where you've got, you know, 50% on the sidelines, I, I rather, instead of just sitting in cash, I'd rather throw it in a portfolio. So that's kind of how I run things. So I think it's beautiful what you're doing, man. So um, okay, I look cool. forward to hearing from it. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I just snapped a screenshot of that and you will see that in my slide deck tomorrow because it mirrors, it's another way of saying exactly what I have a few other charts that are in your show. So this just kind of backs that up as well. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, this is basically what, what the Buffett value is, is basically what it is, is it's how much market capitalization. So basically how, how expensive is the broad stock market? How much money is actually in the stock market versus that country's GDP, right? So if you've got just a, um, you know, if you've got, I mean, let's just push it to an extreme. If you've got a hundred, a hundred times more money in the stock market versus what the current country's GDP is, right? That's going to take at that current rate, right? At that current rate, it's going to take a hundred years to, to offset the amount of uh, money in the stock market if the stock market doesn't go up any further, right? Or go down, right? So that's kind of how much forward, forward investment the stock market is. That's kind of one way to look at it. And you can tell here, you know, in the bottom of 2008 and the financial crisis and stuff like that, that we were severely discounting GDP in the United States. Um, and it'll probably happen again. I mean, it, when no one wants stocks, um, that's when they're a good value. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, just a really cool kind of little fundamental deal. And then um, we'll, we'll see how things kind of pan out. Uh, after this whole Zelensky thing and if this whole war thing cools off and all that, there's geopolitical things. Uh, but no matter what, as, as you can see in the sleep well portfolio's results and, and, and awake and all that stuff, the macro environment is just what it is, right? The market tells us what's kind of going on in the world. We don't need the news to tell us after the fact. Actually, that's exactly what happens though is markets move assets move and then all of a sudden the news comes in and points to some reason and you're like yeah well thanks but you're like a little late on that <laughs> right so as an investor we need to be significantly ahead of that and so um yeah that's kind of that's how so we do funny things. you say that i mean that that's one of the things that i used to teach as well people would always ask about chart patterns and you know, if you do technical analysis, you can kind of, again, through technical analysis, kind of point where you think the market might pull back to, might extend to, et cetera. And people ask, what about the news? What, what if there's, you know, this big news or that big news? 
And the point that played out over and over was the market's going to go to that point. Then somebody's going to explain why it went to that point, and they're going to point to the news. But the market was going to go there anyway. It's just that the news then all of a sudden comes out and creates a reason for it. Right, 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 exactly. <laughs> um, Alan, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah, this, uh, there are lots of different ways to kind of look at it and see what's kind of going on. We do have a lot more of like global GDP. So if you wanted to, you could actually even look at what global GDP is versus global, you know, equities, right? And, and that's another way to look at it. Um, this is simply in a US based. And that is why the Buffett indicator is a little bit older, just because we had a lot more, um, I, I, I don't know, a better way to say this, but like isolationism. Um, in the past where our monetary policy really only predominantly affected our country, right? Um, whichever country you're in. And nowadays, uh, because most countries are synced up, uh, they, they tend to, they tend to um, kind of link to each other, right? Because there's a, a significantly more global um, macroeconomic environment. Now, as wars break out, as alliances break down as geopolitical risks grow, that does start to change a little bit because each country starts to kind of um, self-protect and we go from an expansion era of globalization to more of an individualistic, right? Um, and there's, there's long-term trends of this and stuff like that. And that's typically what leads to uh, world wars and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll see kind of how that all plays out in the future. Um, and uh, what's actually a cool way here, um, I'll show this. As far as macroeconomic goes, you want to uh, share your screen? See, I am. I'm going to pull it up in just a second. Let me get to it. Did I have it? Um, here. Oh, there it is. Bear with me here. Um, all right. So uh, something that I pay attention to is uh, CPI inflation projections across countries. And so um, and um, this is this is a graph that I point to pretty regularly in the service uh, and the sleep well ser service and awake is, is what are countries' currencies versus each other, right? Um, in, in my opinion and, and what I've studied in macroeconomics um, and over years of kind of doing this, their countries' currencies are probably the number one, uh, the number one factor for what their monetary policy is going to do. And then of course, from that monetary policy dictates a lot of their growth or at least how sensitive their growth assets are gonna be such as stocks, right? So um, when we've got a, so back here in this red here, and I'll do this like a full screen so that way it doesn't look so. Um, so we got two reds on here, but it's kind of an orange color, but we'll just kind of allude to this top line right here. We've got, the CPI projections of what the uh, the United States dollar was going to do over these time periods. So here's Q1 of 2022. So we did exceed that just a little bit. Um, but then you can see here projecting going forward that our CPI is going to cool off, right? And that's just, this is just one projection. So uh, if, if anyone's using, so I've got my own proprietary calculations for this, but as far as if you were looking at other people's models, probably put a few of these together, right? And kind of determine your own judgment of kind of how it's gonna look. Um, as, far as, as far as mine goes, uh, we're gonna stay in these five ranges and, and, and uh, four ranges a little bit longer than what this model shows. Uh, but it's still the same basic trend is that we're going to come down versus a lot of the other country, uh, currencies. And then just as Steven and I were just talking about, right? Later on, the some sort of news shows up and you're like, oh, so 
I would have never known that a war was going to do it. Um, but basically, more military spending in the EU and countries around the world at the same time of high inflation and uh, um, versus the United States dollar, right, and geopolitical risks, there's a lot more demand for dollars. There's a lot more demand for um, for a country that is kind of at the that holds the reserve currency and is tightening rates at the same time. At the same time, euro is the or the European Union is, is pretty dramatically going to they're going to spend more money, right? And any time a country spends money, uh, instead of tightening monetary policy, it's going to inflate their currency because we have a fiat system. So anyways, and then what's kind of cool is that we have China down here in this lower red portion, right? And what's really beautiful about this is you can see not only are they trending against each other, but actually China is rising. And that means that the, uh, the currency in China is going to significantly devalue versus the dollar. So that means Chinese products are going to become a lot more attractive on the world stage. That means they're going to be significantly cheaper here in the United States, which means that we're going to see some probably significant imports uh, from China increase um, as long as, you know, geopolitically, we all seem to be friendly again. So it's just kind of a cool thing to kind of pay attention to and, and kind of where things are going this year. And um, I talk more about this in the service about how that affects certain assets like the SPY, the IWM especially emerging markets and China. That's kind of how we get a general exposure to China is emerging markets. EEM is our ETF for that. So yeah, um, super exciting things kind of about what's going on and stuff like that. I really do hope that we can uh, resolve everything that's going on and go into a more peaceful time. Um, so yeah, uh, exciting things. But yeah, macroeconomics are, are kind of one of my passions and I dig into along with my options trades and um, there, I think that they're a really nice pairing to have while you've got a really good environment for butterflies, uh, and you've also got a portfolio that's not going to just be decimated by a correction or even a recession or even a depression. Um, it's a really good way to offset, you know, risks and, uh, still grow your wealth over time. Anyways. Yeah. Anything, Tom? Um, yeah, that's great. Um, nice analysis. I was just looking at the uh, what President Zelensky said. He said he's no longer pressing for NATO membership for Ukraine, and he's open to compromise on the status of the two breakaway pro-Russian territories. So yeah, that could be uh, what Putin needs to back out of the war. We need to give him an out, um, some way to 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 stop all this. Um, I mean, if we just corner them into a corner, that's not a good situation. Um, and yet again, you know, he kind of cornered the West and I, I hate this kind of talk because there is this, this opposition and an opposing forces type of thing. And really, I thought that as humans and civilization, I thought that we kind of passed that level. Um, and I thought that we had a lot more collaboration and collaborative and, and, as a whole that we could kind of grow the world and improve everyone's lives and make the pie bigger. And it seems like we kind of reversed that quite a bit, pretty dramatically to opposing sides and red versus blue and black versus white and all that type of thing. So, um, but anyways, it is what it is. And so hopefully we can uh, band together again soon. Yeah, people were pretty worried about it um, when I was in Europe talking about it. Um, yeah, you don't want to corner them. Then it'll be like an animal with no way out to just do unpredictable things. Uh, yeah, I mean, animals that are cornered and leashed will not only hurt the handler, but they'll hurt themselves to do it too. So, um, and I mean, I'm not saying that he's an animal or anything. So, like, please don't take no, it that but way. It's it's a um, good analogy, though. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I love the commentary i'm so i'm reading the commentary um Andrew's yeah, human great. nature is resistant to change yes <laughs> um, yeah so uh ain't that the truth um we are we are such a slow moving force there's a book that i read um that's called lessons in history and god it is just such a beautiful beautiful way to look at history 
he he writes it he writes about how overall um different civilizations have have grown and fallen but yet how as human we've as human society has evolved and and how it's gotten um, uh, bigger and better yeah it's kind of um there's a there's a big thing out there though yeah anyways investor talk though i'm sorry i'm getting off subject <laughs> no that's okay oh um people in the group might be interested in this you were showing me the uh, ease of movement indicator the other day i, I really like that it's uh, oh yeah it's pretty uh, cool if you've got it up uh that we you can use that or let me i can pull it up myself yeah probably easier for you to talk about it on your screen okay um yeah here i will let me uh, log back into toss really quick uh so there's a i'm i'm working on uh limiting my market looks during the day <laughs> oh yeah that was one thing i liked about icky stuff he only looked at it at a certain time of the day <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Tuesday is kind of my busy day, but I, I do try to just shut down toss and kind of have a life uh, when I'm not needing to do anything. And right now I've collected, I've, well, I've, it's done good things lately. So I just kind of, um, I'm taking a little bit of a break while everything kind of reverses itself. So uh, let me yeah, I'm uh, logging in. And then I'll pull it up. So ease of movement, the whole idea behind ease of movement, uh, let me just kind of give you a, a general overview. Uh, and I'll pull up ease, there we go. And then um, this is gonna get a little bit um, hairy here because I've got a, a, a few different things on my screen. So we'll see this. Uh, doo -doo -doo. We can handle it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so while you're pulling it up, it says right. ease of movement shows the relationship between price and volume, often used to assess strength of an underlying trend. It calculates how easily a price can move up or down. Yeah, so um, on the institutional side of things, right? So let's just kind of come back to just a, a little bit of a um, kind of a, a fundamental approach of just a mechanics of the market, right? So as an institution, uh, if so, let's say I've got a um, hundred billion dollars that I've got to move, right? And I've got the day to do it, right? And if I've got the day to do it, uh, how do I want to fill these orders, right? What's the easiest way to fill these orders? Well, um, typically, as institutions, what we would typically do is we want to make sure that we are buying because we know the position that we want. So regardless of what the market is doing, we have our fundamentals of what we want to do with our portfolio. So as the market is uh, moving during the day, we want to make sure that there are opposing forces to take our orders, right? Because if we fill our orders while the market is going in the same direction that we are, so like let's say the market is going up and we fill our orders to the market going up, we're going to have to jump ahead of the market pretty significantly if we've got a large amount of volume and basically we're going to run up the price so same thing goes in like housing markets and stuff like that so you know you hear about these stories that people ask or people buying like 30 percent over asking price or 10 percent over asking price that's because you're wanting a house at the same time that there's large demand for the house so you have to pay a lot more for that house in order to get in and now sometimes that that's merited right but intraday right? Because we have a fractal nature in the market. Intraday, what we can do is we can sit there and say, well, to get the best price average possible, right? We can only fill orders when uh, there's predominant selling, right? So we'll buy as there's predominant selling coming into the market. And so what ease of movement tells us right here is basically how easy is it for orders that come in to push the price in a specific direction, right? How, like, so if I were to put a, a million dollars versus, uh, you know, a million dollars of futures or a million dollars in shares in one direction, is it going to push it harder in the direction that I'm going to the north side? Or if I push it to the, if, push it to the south side, will it go harder in the south side? 
So basically, when the ease of movement indicator down here, and I've just got this on a 14 day, this is probably pretty standard right here. So, and the market are candles up here, just FYI, I have gray candles because uh, psychologically, I don't like red to see when it's selling because there's lots of opportunities when they're selling. So I just don't like to see red on my screen. Um, so anyways, uh, so, any, so this ease of movement indicator, when it crosses the zero line, right? It's basically just saying that there is, um, if, the, if the buying orders are coming in right now, it has a higher propensity to move in that general direction, right? It's easier for the price to swing aggressively to the north side, right? And then of course, when it's to the south side, when it crosses across the zero, if there's a, a big seller that steps in or anything like that, it's gonna have a lot easier movement to the downside. So you can see that the candles get a lot bigger to the downside versus the upside when that kind of happens. And that's because the amount of volume that's coming in in these candles is leading to a further price move, right? Um, so a lot of people look at uh, uh, like volume in general, right? And say, okay, yeah, there's a lot of volume that came in on that bar. Well, what, you want, what we wanna know is we wanna know, okay, all of that volume, did it get absorbed? right? Or did it get um, accelerated, right? So when we see a big volume bar come in, so like uh, we can turn this over to uh, like an equi volume chart. Um, so when we see a large amount of volume come in, right? What did it do, right? A large amount of volume came in, but it's not like it got absorbed, right? We've had, we still have significant ease of movement right here. Everything's doing fine. So this is probably going to keep coming in, right? Large amount of volume came in, but we didn't see a big drop in the ease of movement on that large volume. Definitely still going higher, right? Now take that into consideration up here, right? And we can start to see that the volume that's coming in, even though it's, it's rather large, still like the past history, a lot of this volume is leading to a drop in the ease of movement. So there's some level of absorption coming in, right? So that means that this big rally that we've been having is definitely slowing down. The, the, the power behind it is slowing down. Um, and then if you get you know, some really uh, strong volume, even to the upside, but yet you see the ease of movement drop off pretty dramatically like it's been doing, it is a really good uh, indicator in the beginning of saying, hey, things are probably not going to uh, continue in that direction, right? Um, so just kind of an idea, just kind of fun things um, to, to note. Uh, I like just using ease of movement for if I'm filling a rather large order uh, for the day. Um, so let's say in my passive portfolio, I've got my sleep well, or awake and I'm really concentrated in one asset uh, like we've been in gold and dollars. So if we go to gold and gold's still having an update even though it's been selling off here at the end, uh, we've got a large amount of volume that's been coming in, but then let's go to uh, back to our candles. So it's a little bit easy, more easily read readable, right? And a lot of movement happened pre-market but you can see here that ease of movement was sliding all day, sliding, 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 um, just as the market was even pushing up. And we still had some ease of movement up here, but then it dramatically reversed course. And you can see, it. I mean, it's clear. It's just like, hey, now the, the selling frenzy has begun and it flipped, right? And so once we saw these few candles come in and you see that ease of movement was falling off and it wasn't accelerating anymore, you can just tell it's just not there, right? And then we slide down and still the ease of movement is still negative. It's not falling necessarily anymore, um, but it's definitely still negative. So would we be surprised to see a large candle to the downside right now? Absolutely not. Um, that would, it would make perfect sense. Ease of movement still significantly to the downside. What would be more surprising is a very large movement to the upside in gold. Um, so Kind of fun things to, to look at. You know, here's emerging markets. Um, as the dollar weakens, this will be good for them. But uh, I'm trying to get, there was a lot of uh, 
uh, there was a lot of buying and selling this morning because of how oversold the market was yesterday. So I'm just trying to get into a general close up here. So you can see this big rally. You can see that we're having a big drop off in ease of movement right now to the upside. So if this starts to point pretty uh, significantly south, it means that that sellers, the sellers have basically started to take over, right? And the ease of movement has shifted and, and the, the big players in the market um, have definitely gone to the other side. So it's probably the end of the trend. Um, so that's kind of what Tom was saying, that it, it signifies the strength of the trend, right? And uh, it can be a little bit of, a, of, a, of an early warning. At the same time, institutions, we use this because, uh, well, uh, not anymore, but we used to use institutions, or as institutions, we used to use this with like, hey, can I put my order in without pushing the price aggressively, right? Is there someone there to take my order, right? If I've got to fill 100,000 shares of this, I want to do it on a selling bar, but at the same time, I want to make sure that that ease of movement is still inside uh, inside my range to where I can shove it in and it be absorbed and I can kind of hide my, my orders inside the market. Um, so yeah, anyways, fun times. And just one caveat, you need volume, so it won't work on SPX. Ah, yes. Good. Good. Yeah. So futures, that's why I pulled up futures and things like that. Um, you do want volume. It, uh, if you go into like, uh, um, something like Apple or something like that. Um, and like I said, this gets kind of wonky in off hours. So just make sure that you're um, in like the, the regular hours. trading hour session. Right, exactly. So you can see the ease of movement in the morning after the first bell was falling pretty dramatically, right? Went negative, uh, went negative before this big candle right here. Um, and then it basically stayed on the lower end through this, but then you can see we've basically been climbing, still okay. You can still see even as the market's coming down here, the ease of movement is to the south side. And then we pop right here back up to positive for ease of movement. And that's basically saying, hey, from now on, the powers are on the buyer's side, right? The power of price movement is on the buyer's side from this point on. So if I'm wanting to fill my orders, and I was wanting to go long Apple, I should have been doing it all morning. And now if I'm in here, I really need to just shove them in because uh, the power to the upside, if I've got to get it done for the day, um, or I've got to hold off until it goes the other direction. And so you can kind of average this out. And so that's why you see these big candles to the upside start to show up. And it's because the ease of movement flipped over. And it's really easy to see these in stocks versus indexes because index futures um, and macro economics um are a little bit stronger um but they don't uh they don't move like a stock does per se it's like the volume that comes into the es futures doesn't necessarily move those stocks instantly um so looking at an individual name sometimes is a little bit easier but they still show us where the path is do you have any favorite time frames to use the ease of movement or it seems like it works on all time frames? Um, yeah, you kind of got to play with your uh, you kind of got to play with your time frame. I do like five minute bars on this. Um, it, it, one minute bars are a little bit too uh, noisy. noisy. Yeah, you get just a little too much noise in one minute bars. Um, so not saying that they're not there or anything like that. It just depends on your time frame that you that you trade. I mean, just clear as day. You've got downside ease of movement all through here. So you can see that we did have larger candles to the downside all through this. And then right around here to this midpoint, right? You can see that even as the market tried to push down again through here, um, the ease of movement was going to the north side. And then as soon as we broke the ease of movement to the north side, right before these big, large candles, right? If I was a seller through all of this and I made my money, I definitely want to be out now and honestly, I'd be looking for a buy entry, right? So if I see this big buyer, we got a good, nice price movement. And then we get a pullback coming into here and we get good, strong ease of movement still to the north side, you know, buy in, get your, get your deal, right? You know, whatever tactic buy the dip. you use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whatever tactic you use, you know, first pullback after a trend change or something like that. Um, that's always a good deal. So like you see, see the passive move uh, path 
uh, or the ease of movement kind of go to the north side and you're like, here, let me, let me grab the first pullback, pullback by boom. And then, you know, you get your scalp in. maybe you're a scalper. There's lots of different ways to kind of use this, but it's just nice to know who's the stronger force to push price around right now. Right. Um, it's kind of like when you're, when you're buying a butterfly, um, if you're buying like a butterfly positioned behind the market, right? If the market is screaming to the north side, right? But volatility isn't going down at the same time, right? It's a really, really cheap time to buy a butterfly, right? So um, it's kind of the same concept, right? Does that market environment, is it conducive to what position you wanna hold? And if you're a buyer and you want to be a buyer through this, right there you have the market at your you've got a tailwind for price movement in your direction and as soon as you lose that tailwind or it starts to go south like it is right now right you definitely lost your tailwind and rallies are probably not as strong anymore right even on this pullback you still had positive right everything's doing okay yes it's weakening yes it's weakening that one right here this pullback we're finally kind of getting a little bit of a weak um, ease of movement. So that would be, you know, some time that you'd want to say, okay, this trend's probably pretty close to done. And then you sit there and you come up here and yet again, you get another negative over here that, you know, the trend's definitely probably done. It's probably a good time to collect your profit. So you can use the, the price action and the volume and the fundamental of the, of what's pushing price around to dictate your trade rather than having like a price target. And if I'm letting a trade run or something like that, or if I'm intraday trying to push a, port, uh, uh, a position, uh, this is kind of something that I use. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks like we're about 30 points off the high already. So, yeah, it's definitely coming down. Yeah, e ease of movement to the south side right now. So, um, you know, definitely selling is a little bit more prominent right now. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, I really like that. Um, so hopefully people can find a use for it because it is a good indicator. Um, so just to recap, uh, we've got the sleep on awake at new high. So congrats. Um, Steve's presenting his butterfly class and alert service tomorrow. Uh, Dan Harvey and I will be doing the boxcar stuff next week. And uh, if you missed Amy's uh, A14 performance for 2022, it's in the library. So uh, go have a watch before it rolls off. And I put some links in the description for the Buffett indicator and ease of movement and that kind of stuff. So um, no need to write all that stuff down. It's all ready for you when I get the recording posted. So it's good to be back. And uh, you were speaking of tailwinds. We had a 159 mile an hour tailwind going to Europe. It was nuts. We had a 1100 kilometer per hour uh, ground speed. Let's see what that is in miles. PH to MPH, 683 mile an hour ground speed. It was crazy. So we, we got Chicago to Brussels in seven hours and seven minutes. It's normally like over eight. So it was fun. Uh, but anyway, good to be home. Um, everything's uh, normal, normal again. So we'll, uh, we'll see you all tomorrow for Steve's presentation. And uh, yeah, um, we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone for participating and uh, Great to be back. Thank you all. See you tomorrow. Yep. See you, Steve. Bye.